também suporte para a gente, estudantes, colegas, que todos estão aqui. É, felicidade para todos nós, estamos aqui, o professor Graham Pearson, que é um dos mais prominentes pesquisadores de Kimberlitz, diamantes da sua geração. Apenas para você ter uma ideia, o professor Graham Pearson tem mais de 15 mil citações bibliográficas, sendo que nos últimos cinco anos, mais de 7 mil citações. E, principalmente relacionado com as pesquisas científicas e a geração delas, e trabalhando com técnicas analíticas de ponta, principalmente técnicas pontuais, tanto relacionadas à laser ablation, quanto relacionadas a outros tipos de isótopos corpusuais de grande complexidade, como o rengosmo e assim por diante. É uma grande oportunidade que nós temos aqui de justamente ter uma palestra agora sobre quimberlitos, cratons e diamantes. So, I would like to thank you again, Graham, for the opportunity. Please, we are here to, uh, here to hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Well uh, done. Good afternoon. <laughs> that is the only word of Portuguese I know, so I apologize. <laughs> I'm, um, I will speak in English. I will speak, uh, try and speak slowly, but if you, if you want me to repeat something, please just stick your hand up and, and ask me to repeat it. Please. If it's not clear or if it's too good. It, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Rogerio has been showing me the facilities you have at USP, which are actually truly world class. You should be very proud that you have amazing facilities here that, that allow you to do some great science. And I have to thank you for the invitation to come and speak. Okay, so I will talk in, in about some generalities of my research interests and a few new results and, and some not so new results but that are interesting. Um, I'm going to focus on this theme of kimberlites, cratons and diamonds and maybe come up at the end with perhaps a new exploration paradigm for, for where to look for diamonds next or, or, or why we the old exploration models for looking for diamonds might have missed some really important de deposits that are still there to be found, maybe in Brazil. Okay, so we'll start just quickly because I know not everybody in the room that studies kimberlites, although a lot of people study alkaline rocks here, which is very good. Um, the kimberlites are, are these volcanic pipes that, that erupt through the Earth's crust. So this is one of the larger kimberlites. It's certainly the world's most valuable diamond in Arctic Canada. And actually, is one of the rare occurrences where kimberlites make, we'll come back to, of what a kimberlite might look like when it erupts. So we're blasting deeply derived material through the lithosphere, lithosphere mantle and the crust to the surface. And so this cartoon shows the scheme of kimberlite pipe, a diatreme pipe, and then these hyperbyssal intrusive rocks, either sills or dikes, down at the lower portions of the kimberlite. Very rarely do we see this preserved, but there are one or two places in the world where you see this tough ring preserved. So here is actually a mine model made up from Canadian kimberlites. You can see actually it's more like a carrot-shaped structure. Um, and then on top of this, we have volcanic material. In this case, this is the Greasy Hills in Kenya. These are the youngest kimberlites ever found, probably less than 10,000 years old. And this is a tephra cone, and this is kimberlite lava flowing out of the tephra cone. But usually the erosion level cuts the pipe, cuts it off here, and so we have these pipeline structures. Here are examples from Greenland. So at the base of this pipe, there are these dikes. This is brown uh, kimberlite dike intruding Archean gneisses in West Greenland. And you can see that the contact between the kimberlite and the gneisses is extremely sharp with very little, um, uh, very little associated metamorphism. There's a big mantle-derived garnet in the kimberlite. There are some ilmenites also. There's the a garnet again in thin section, but you can see from this that at every scale there are 
fragments of mantle-derived rocks that get blown apart and mixed in with the kimberlite magma, making it very difficult to work out what the kimberlite magma is. Why would we study kimberlites? Well, for the obvious reason that they contain diamonds, and in fact these are some of the biggest diamonds in the world from uh, the Cullinan mine, the Petra diamonds here. This is a 600 carat type 2 diamond. This is a 300 carat type 2 diamond. So this is a Botswana diamond, this is a South African diamond. And these diamonds sell for 30, 40, 50 million dollars each, which is a good reason to look for and <coughs> diamonds. Where do kimberlites occur? Well, you have them in Brazil. Here's a map of kimberlite, or diamond occurrences actually, that correlate with kimberlites. There's some alluvial diamonds that do not correlate with kimberlites, but the diamonds here, these are kimberlite occurrences. And the thing I want to focus on for a little moment is that there's this association between kimberlites and kratons. But in, by kratons, I mean a slightly more broader general definition than, than maybe many of you are used to. Some people define kraton as an area of rocks that are older than 2.5 billion years old. But actually, the gray on this map, these are areas of 2.5 billion year old rocks or more exposed. But the kimberlites occur well outside those, and these, these red dots are the defined boundaries often from geophysics of where the actual craton boundaries is, craton boundaries are, and, and you will see this is very all-encompassing because it includes, and I think we should include as a definition of a craton, rocks that are as young as two billion years old because the dynamic history of these areas continues until two billion years, 1.8 billion years, before they really become big, solidified, coherent, rigid uh, large cratons. And the kimberlites occur associated with these cratons, but actually, as we'll see shortly, a lot of them focus towards the edges of the thick cratonic lithosphere. So there is a, beneath the cratonic crust, there are thick keels of peridotitic lithosphere. And so this is a seismological map, if you like. It's a slice through the earth. It's a, a S-wave anomaly map at 200 kilometers depth, and the blue equals cold, deep lithosphere still at 200 kilometers depth. The pink dots here are kimberlite occurrences, and you can see a very strong relationship between the kimberlite occurrences and these deep keels. But actually, if you look closely, it's hard to see at this scale, there's a stronger association between the kimberlite occurrences and the margins of some of these areas, the edges, especially in Australia here, the kimberlites appear to be focused around the edges of cratons where there's a thickness gradient. <coughs> and here, this is a new map we've produced where you can parameterize the sort of tectonic or categorize craton versus proterozoic fold belts versus phanerozoic areas by using the seismology to define these, these areas where we're classifying the thickness of the lithosphere mantle root beneath the area. Okay, so let's come back to what is a kimberlite. I think most of you will know that they are ultra-basic silica undersaturated rocks. They're particularly low in aluminium, but also they are surprisingly low in sodium and, and potassium. In fact, they're really hard to to call alkaline rocks, then certainly not ultra-potassic, as is commonly referred to in textbooks, and then probably not even potassic. The average potassium content of a kimberlite is about the same as the average mid-ocean ridge basalt, which is very low. Their key characteristics really are this, this silica undersaturatedness, they're very rich in magnesium, and they're also rich in CO2 and water. <coughs> And you can see, this may be hard to read, but the, so these are, on this diagram, these are kimberlites on this end of the diagram, and these are other rocks, ultramafic lamprophires and lamprolites. And this really, it, this is meant to illustrate the distinction between kimberlites and, and these other related rocks, 
So here is silica. If you can read, this is 25 to 30 weight percent silica, so much lower than typical basalts. The lamproites are higher in silica. And <coughs> magnesium, very high magnesium content, so 30% to 35 weight percent. Some of this is olivine accumulate, or olivine addition. The yellow here is the estimate of what the primary kimberlite melt composition might be, which is something around 26% NGO. That's the same as a kamatiite, actually. So you could, in many ways, you could view these things as very deeply derived, CO2-rich, water-rich, kamatiitic mags. I wouldn't call them that, but that's their NGO contents are extremely high in the primitive melts. And again, low potassium and low sodium, apart from one or two very unusual occurrences, some in Russia that I won't talk about. If you want to classify a kimberlite, then this is best done, especially in altered kimberlites, using the spinels. Spinels are very characteristic, sorry, kimberlites have very characteristic spinel chemistry, ranging from these magnesium chromite compositions, with trends going towards more aluminous and more titanium rich compositions. And the micas, in particular, in kimberlites are very characteristic in that they are relatively low titanium, high aluminium phlogopites. This phlogopite chinochitolite compositional range rather than the tetraferrophlogopite compositions that come down in this side of the diagram. So the spinels and the micas are probably the strongest way to mineralogically classify the kimberlite. How do kimberlites form? Well, this is a big problem and there is still very little agreement on where exactly kimberlites form. And the, the argument centers around whether they form either in or at the base of the lithosphere or whether they come much deeper from much deeper in the Earth in the transition zone or even the lower mantle. This is the cross section illustrating those two possibilities. So here we've got the craton, here we've got the kimberlites either coming from very deep or from, or from right at the base of the lithosphere. One constraint on this is that these super deep diamonds that we will talk about, some that come from Brazil, from the Juina area, some of them preserve high pressure mineral phases that are characteristic of these regions, and that's part of the evidence that supports the idea that some part of that kimberlite magma might start life way down here. But the problem with the genetic model is that it's very difficult to work out what the exact composition of this kimberlite melt is. And that's because, as we've said, the kimberlite is full of everything that it travels through on the way to the surface. So even if you can find a kimberlite that has got very little crust in it, like this kimberlite, it is full of lithospheric mantle. So all these high birefringence olivine grains in this photograph are all come from mantle prototypes that the kimberlite intersects in the lithosphere and breaks apart. And so what you measure as a hand specimen in the kimberlite is really dominated by this disaggregated kimberlite. And so if you plot, and this gives each kimberlite a regional distinctive geochemical composition. So here is the magnesium silica ratio of each kimberlite. I've plotted 10 different kimberlites on here from Canada. These two are Canada, well, these three are Canada, Namibia, South Africa and Russia and Greenland. This is the magnesium silica ratio of the kimberlite. This is the magnesium silica ratio of the, the lithospheric mantle that they travel through as measured by the prototypes in this. And you can see there's a direct one-to-one -one correlation. Magnesium silica ratio, if you're not a geochemist, you can view, you can view that as really it's, it reflects the ratio of olivine to orthopyroxene. So a high magnesium silica ratio is a very olivine rich orthopyroxene poor mantle. A low magnesium silica ratio is a mantle that's got a lot more orthopyroxene. Not, not more than olivine, but maybe 30% or more orthopyroxene. And you can see that the Greenland kimberlites here, they erupt and transport mantles in this that are very rich in olivine. These are all the olivines. And that means the bulk composition of the kimberlite is really dominated, the major elements, by that lithosphere mantle. So if you want to work out what the melt composition is, you have to subtract all this stuff out, which is extremely difficult. And that's the biggest uncertainty in evaluating 
what the composition of the kimberlite is. <clears throat> and then these kimberlites from uh, Canada are from much more of the pyroxene rich mantle, and that drags their composition down here. So the real composition of the melt is somewhere in here that's mixing that way and that way with the mantle. Now one way potentially around this is to look, instead of the major elements, at the trace elements and the isotopes. If I would have... I'm sorry, if I'd have known the screen was this size, I would have made the diagrams bigger, I'm sorry. You will have to zoom in. One way to interrogate the compositions of these rocks is instead of the major elements, which are totally dominated by, by these peridotites, is to use the trace elements and isotopes. And that's because these olivine-rich lithospheric peridotites have very low concentrations of incompatible trace elements and their isotopes. And so the mixing of those peridotites has a small effect on the trace element and isotopic composition. And so if we just if we focus for the moment on these diagrams, these are trace element ratios, barium, niobium, cerium, lead, thorium, niobium, uranium, lead. And you won't be able to see the cross on here is the primitive mantle composition here and here. And so classic archetypal kimberlites plot in the same field as ocean island basalt magnets. They have very normal mantle like thorium lead and barium niobium ratios, slightly more extended cerium lead and uranium lead. This is due to the effects of small degree partial melting pushing them out this way. But they look like they have the trace element compositions of magmas, melts that come from the convecting mantle, not the lithospheric mantle. That view is supported by the radiogenic isotope composition. So here is neodymium, and on this axis, strontium, hafnium, and neodymium here. And you can see the blue dots here are the kimberlites. The pink field is the ocean island basalt compositions. And you can see this direct overlap between the kimberlites and the ocean island basalts. Anything that's a lamprolite or what used to be called a group <coughs> two kimberlite, which I would now call a carbonated lamprolite, plot way down in these enriched fields here where the lithospheric mantle plot. The scatter away from this oil field is probably just alteration in kimberlites here. So there's a really nice correspondence in the trace elements and the radiogenic isotopes between convecting mantle and kimberlite. And in fact, I haven't got time to go into the detail, but if we look at the subtleties of these trace element fractionations here, not only does this support the idea that the magnets come from the convecting mantle, but actually it's supportive of the idea that the magnets come from actually quite deep convecting mantle that has not been mixed with a lot of recycled material. So maybe the transition zone at least. I can expand on that argument if anybody wants me to. Okay, one thing we're, we've been trying to do, which is helpful in, in working out how kimberlites form, because I, even if we can tell you where the source region might be in the deep earth, there's still this discussion about well, are they related to plumes or what triggers a kimberlite eruption? And to, to get at that information, then the age of the kimberlite is important. But like everything else with kimberlites, that's not a simple thing to do. If you want an easy life, do not work on kimberlites, because everything about them <laughs> is very complicated, as Rogerio will tell you. So there are a few options for dating kimberlites that are demanding and time-consuming, but you have to do this to get reliable age constraints. So we use this mineral perovskite, C-A-S-I-O-T-I-S-I-O-3. Uh, uh, there's a perovskite in thin section with a phlogopite here. Here are little perovskites that are picked out of disaggregating the kimberlite. We now use a cell frag and electronic disaggregation device that blows the kimberlite apart using high voltage. And that is a, uh, I think that's a 20 micron scale bar here. So you have to have a lot of patience to pick out these very small perovskites to then mount and, or either dissolve or mount and do laser ablation analyses. Sometimes there are zircons occurring in the kimberlite. This is a zircon grain with a bedellite reaction rim, and here's the kimberlite. 
And a lot of the early age constraints on kimberlites were using the zircons. And that works okay, but actually we're finding more and more that there are a whole spectrum of zircons in kimberlites that are considerably older than the kimberlite that they're in. So you have to, if you want to use zircon, you have to analyze a lot of zircons to be sure that you might be approximating that eruption age. So a better way is the perovskite or the phlogopites here, where you can use rubidium strontium. And so recently, we've been using uh, laser ablation to try and speed up this process of dating kimberlites. So Ruggiero visited my institution recently, and uh, we were developing some improved ways of doing this. So here's an example of what we can do with the laser ablation now. So these are single perovskite grains. This is the Vesselton kimberlite in South Africa. And we can get what appear to be quite precise ages almost at the 1.5% precision on 86 to 87 million year old kimberlites that agree pretty well with the thermal ionization age, except that this, is, this looks a bit too good because actually the perovskites are not like zircons with zircon. All the lead in zircon is the product of uranium decay. In perovskite, because it's a calcium rich mineral, there's a lot of lead that the, the perovskite takes in at the same time that it's crystallizing, in addition to lead derived from uranium decay. And so we call that common lead or non-radiogenic lead. So if we look at the proportion of non-radiogenic lead, <coughs> which is the 206 lead in each sample, and the uncertainty that will give you in the age, sure, in, the, in low common lead perovskite, so here this is the Africander perovskite. It's a perovskite from a, kimber from a carbonatite. And if you, date, if you use that as your standard, you might think you're doing amazingly well, and maybe you can get down to this sort of level of precision, and you think that's a realistic error. But actually, the perovskites in kimberlites have much higher common lead, much higher uh, lead that they take in during crystallization, between 40% for these South African perovskites and some of Ruggiero's samples here have up to 80 or 90 percent common lead, which means the uncertainty on the age is actually much bigger than just doing this statistical fix on the laser ablation. And so we have to develop, we have been developing some additional techniques to constrain this common lead composition. And the way there are two ways of doing this that are related to each other. So here is a this is the uranium lead ratio, which we measure, and also the 207-206 lead ratio, which we measure, which reflects some of the common lead composition. So this, this is age on this curve here. These are young ages here. And the further away from you are from this line, ideally, a, a, a crystal with no inherited common lead should plot right on this line and give you a very precise age. That's not the case for almost all kimberlitic perovskites. This spread of data points is because there's a lot of common unradiogenic uh, yeah, un lead in the perovskite, but we can use this to our advantage by regressing through here to this axis to estimate that composition, which we can then use in the age calculation to give us an age here this is a, a Saskatchewan, a Canadian Kimberlite, 420, 416, plus or minus 18. We can try a similar exercise in three dimensions using all the, well, nearly all the lead isotopes, all the uranogenic lead isotopes and the 204 lead. Here's the measured data. When we estimate the common lead and recalculate the ages and we take the mean, we get exactly the same as this. This is 416, this is 417 plus or minus 14, but these are much more realistic uncertainties that take into account the fact that we have a lot of common let. But when you see there are a lot of published ages that look like this, that are really not very realistic. If you look at the individual uncertainties on these individual data points, they're much larger than this. This, is, this comes from just calculating a weighted mean. It's a statistical fudge, we call it in English. I don't know what the Portuguese is, but it's... It's slightly cheating. Okay. Those are methods where the kimberlite is altered. Perovskite is a good method. If you have fresher kimberlites, which are not in too many areas of the world, 
But in some places, in, in Arctic regions, in Arctic Canada and in Finland, where the weathering is, is not like here, so, so the kimberlites are much fresher, then you can do very well. This is a strontium isochron diagram. And the age of these Finnish kimberlites, 747 plus or minus 4. So very small precisions there, less than 1% precision on the age, less than half a percent precision. And that rubidium strontium age agrees very nicely with the argon-argon plateau age of 747.8 MA. So they, those two totally different isotopic methods agree within one million years of the age of this kimberlite. Okay, so it's difficult, but how do we use the kimberlite age information, or why do we want to use it? So here's a, here's a global summary that my colleague Larry Heeman and I and David Phillips from Melbourne put together. We are, if you're interested in Kimberlites, the December issue of this Elements magazine we're editing, and there will be a whole issue on Kimberlites. And we have several papers in there, but one of which is, is ge the geochronology of Kimberlites. And so here are all the Kimberlite, the what we think are reliable Kim estimates of Kimberlite eruption ages through time. And you can see that kimberlites don't just erupt all the time. There are pulses of kimberlite magnetism at different periods in Earth history. Probably the oldest kimberlite in the world is, is around 2 billion years old. There are papers suggesting there might be 2.5 billion year old kimberlites. We are not very convinced that those rocks are actually kimberlites. The oldest ones are around 2 billion years old. And then there's a peak, a sudden spike at around 1.2 billion years of kimberlite activity around 500, 520 million years. This is around 350 in the Ordovician here, or Devonian, sorry. And then in the Cretaceous here, between 90 and 50 million years, the majority of the world's kimberlites formed in this period, including the Brazilian kimberlites. And you will notice I put these diamond symbols here because these are some of the world's largest, most productive diamond mines occur in these big pulses of kimberlite activity and not in the small little pulses that are less abundant. So if you have small numbers of kimberlites and small kimberlites, they're much less likely to be big economic mines than when you have a lot of kimberlites, especially in these age periods. Now if you break that down into different continents, you can, use, you can try and use this data to address different models. So this actually is a, a map of northern and Canadian kimberlites. It's very hard to see at this scale, but this is the deep lithosphere here, this is the craton, and the idea of the study was to look at age progression along a trend of kimberlites. And in this map, there is an age progression going from about, well, these are, these are ocean island magmas at 82 million years, but then the first kimberlites we get here are 115 million years, and there's an age progression to 200 million years along this track, which some people have used to argue for a plume track causing the kimberlite eruption ages. Now, here are this, here's this information broke, broken down in different regions, and you can see that different regions actually have slightly different pulses of magma. So this 520 million year age of between 520 and 580 million year pulse of kimberlite activity is very common in North America and Greenland. It's relatively common in Africa. There is a big diamond mine in Africa of that age, but it's absent in Russia. So for some reason, there are no 520 MA kimberlites in Russia. Instead, there's a lot of Devonian kimberlites. In fact, the two very big mines in Russia are Devonian in age, 350 million years. And there are these 200 million year old kimberlites, but there are very few Cretaceous kimberlites in Russia, and the ones there are have no diamonds. Whereas there are lots of Cretaceous kimberlites in Africa and North America that have diamonds. In South America, the picture is less clear because there just aren't that many ages on the South American kimberlites, and that would be a really good thing to improve. There are some, and the ones that exist are dominantly in this Cretaceous period here, but it would be really interesting and critical to date more of the South American kimberlites. The problem is they are quite altered, and one of the things Ruggiero is trying to do is improve the accuracy and precision on the ages available. The reason we want to do that is because 
in northern Canada, we can use the ages. There is a relationship that we don't understand the cause of between the diamond grade here. So size of the diamond symbol is equivalent to the, the richness of the diamonds in the deposit and the age. And you can see that one of the first things that an exploration company does in Canada when they find a kimberlite is they try and measure the age. Because if you have a kimberlite that is between 55 and 45 million years old, you are much more likely to have a lot of diamonds in that kimberlite than if you have a kimberlite that is 70 million years old. They have a few diamonds. These are pretty rich kimberlites from to elsewhere, but they're nowhere near. They're factors of 10 lower in diamond grain than these kimberlites in the Eocene period here. So the age is used by especially Canadian exploration companies very successfully as one indication of whether that, that kimberlite might be a good economic resource. Okay, so I'm going to now just take you briefly through uh, what is a new emerging paradigm in looking for diamonds. So, so it, it, most of the big diamond deposits, you can argue, have, have been found so far. That's one view, and that's a view of people looking for any mineral deposits. All the easy stuff has been found, and we need to think more laterally about how to find new kimberlite or new diamond deposits or new deposits that are world-class in size of anything, because they use exploration models that were established in the case of kimberlites 40 years ago. And we need to re-examine whether these exploration models really truly hold in today's new source of data. So to do that, we'll look at when, when diamonds form, what the new source rocks are that might be for diamonds, and we'll take a quick look at super deep diamonds as well, because that's one of the reasons I came to Brazil. So for those of you that are not familiar with this, diamonds commonly occur in two main host rocks. There is the Harzbergite type host rock. Now this might look like an old Harzbergite, and that's because deep in the mantle, all the chromium is in these beautiful purple high chromium garnets. Here's a diamond in contact with a high chromium garnet and olivine. That's actually, it's more like a dunite, that rock, than a Harzbergite. This is a what essentially people call the Harzbergite host. And then other diamonds are hosted in eclogites. So this is an eclogite right here. The, the, the garnet is less rich in chromium and more rich in iron. These are pyroalmandines. And there's lots of diamonds in this rock. There's probably 10% of this rock that's diamond. So these eclogites are very rich hosts for diamonds. And that was really the... the model for what rocks host diamonds in the mantle for 40 years. But now, as I'll show you, these lurzolites are becoming much more important, uh, as important as Harzbergite. So here's a nice purple chrome-rich Harzbergite. Lurzolitic diamonds are more like the color of, of wine. Well, it depends which wine you, you drink. This is more like Argentinian wine is a nice deep purple color. Cheap Italian wine is a kind of <laughs> But the Lurzolites have clinopyroxene present, and the Halsbergites do not. And the importance of this is several fold. So the old model is that the Halsbergitic diamonds, they all form between 3 and 3.5 billion years ago. That's not really true anymore. There are examples of Halsbergitic diamonds that are as young as 2 billion years. The Eclogitic diamonds there are some Archean ages, but eclogitic diamonds are forming right through later parts of Earth history, almost to the Phanerozoic, and I'm sure there are eclogitic diamonds forming in the Phanerozoic, we just haven't measured them yet. But look at the green. These are lurzolitic diamonds, and the lurzolitic diamonds are also forming all through geological time, particularly through the, starting in the Proterozoic and running into the, the Neoproterozoic and even the Phanerozoic. And these are an odd form of fibrous diamonds that are often late stage overgrowth from all these diamonds, which we have known for a while, form relatively recently. These lurzolitic diamonds are the new exploration paradigm, because not only do they form much later in Earth history than people previously thought, but they also form a significant part of the diamond inclusion assemblage on a global basis. They form about 8% of the worldwide diamond inclusion perigenesis with Hartsbergites forming nearly 60% and Equigites forming 
But actually, on an individual location scale, there are locations now which are totally dominated by this lerzolite paragenesis, which has been totally <coughs> overlooked by exploration companies for a long time. So here's a, we look at, we measure, it's very simple analyzing garnets. We, we are really interested in two main elements in term, for diamonds, calcium and chromium. These purple garnets are very high in chromium and low in calcium. This cheap wine-colored garnets, the Lerzolite garnets, are higher in calcium. They can also be very high in chromium, but the calcium keeps the purple color fairly, fairly neutered. And then these are the eclogitic diamonds, which are very rich in calcium with no chromium. Now, I'll show you data, data for two Canadian diamond deposits, a huge deposit that is not yet being mined, but is being evaluated by Rio Tinto in Saskatchewan here in Canada. This is this place where this idiot Mr. Trump is in charge, similar to your Mr. <laughs> Bolsonaro, I believe. This is, this is a real sensible country where we have sensible politicians. This is called Canada. <laughs> North is far. Okay, so these are... So this is Saskatchewan, and then this is Ontario. This is the Victor mine in Ontario. And these are beautiful diamonds. Both these locations have lerzolitic diamonds. Probably the most valuable diamonds that are not huge, that the, where the value is in the quality of the stone and not the size of the stone. Victor probably has the best diamonds of any pipe in the world. And these are some of the Saskatchewan diamonds at Fort Alacorn. Also very valuable as well because they have these beautiful yellow colors too. <clears throat> and these, this is the diamond inclusion population at Victor. So here's our purple garnet field, sometimes called G10, high chrome, low calcium. Here is the lerzolitic field for the inclusions in the diamonds at Victor. There's not a single inclusion in these diamonds that's in this high chromium field. They're all lerzolites. <clears throat> and so Typically what people do is when they're in the field measuring, when they're looking at diamond indicator garnets, because you, you don't find many diamonds in the field, but you find the garnets from the prototypes. If you, 30 years ago, if you found a whole bunch of indicator minerals looking like this, that were all lerzolites with none of these interesting G10 garnets, you'd walk away from that deposit and you would miss this. This is a world class, this is one of the world's most valuable diamond mines in terms of quality of stone, so it's been mined for 20 years now in, in, um, in Ontario, but the beers have kept the identity of the inclusion compositions fairly secret until my colleague Thomas Starkle published them last year. So Victor is dominated by a Lerzolite composition garnet. And then Fort Alacorn at Saskatchewan, well, we have not yet published that, but I can tell you that for these garnets also the inclusions in the diamonds also look exactly like this. The interesting thing, we don't have good age constraints on the age of the lithosphere here, but in Saskatchewan, these diamonds are forming in what's called the Sask Kraton. kraton. And you might think if I use the word kraton, that means, oh, the lithosphere there must be 2.5 billion years old. But it turns out that is not the case. So here, this is just a a cartoon, a cross-section, deep lithosphere under the craton, and the old model is that this must be 2.5 billion year lithosphere. These are really osmium ages from the pyridotypes from the SAS craton, and they're all around 2 billion years, with a few just making it into uh, this, well, not quite the Archean, actually. There's the Archean proterozoic boundary. So there are no Archean ages in the lithosphere there. So not, not only do we have lerzolitic diamonds, but we have Proterozoic, paleoproterozoic lithosphere. And so the diamonds there must be younger than that age. And in, in fact, these, these diamonds here from Victor, those are 700 million years old. Not 3.5 billion years old, 700 million years old. That's totally different than the old paradigm for Archean hearts for diamonds. So it turns out this 2 billion year age is a key time in Earth history because. As I alluded to earlier, that's when several of these cratons were actually put together at a larger scale. So this big craton here that we call the Ray Craton 
was actually stabilized at 1.8 to 2 billion years, not, not 2.5 billion years. Oh. If we look at the lithosphere from a lot of northern Canada here, and we try and get the age of it, we haven't got ages through here yet, but we see this signature where these are kimberlite-derived mantle peridotites, and the age, and there are diamonds in both these localities, the age of the lithosphere is 2 billion years. You might think, okay, this is way up in Arctic Canada, who cares about that? No one's ever going to mine there, and, you know, and you're probably right. So let's go and look somewhere else, where it is much more important. Here, there are big world-class mines in Siberia that have been mined for the last 50 years. You know that they erupt through very thick lithosphere here. It's very thick lithosphere in those other areas I showed you in Arctic Canada. This is 200 kilometer thick lithosphere here. Blue equals cold and thick on this seismic diagram. And this is a <coughs> quite complicated looking, but this is the age spectrum for the Udashnaya, for the Siberian mantle peridotites. This is the rhenium osmium ages on the peridotites. There's a little bit of Archean material, but in Udashnaya, which is their main mine, the age of the peridotites is that uh, for most of them is between 1.8 and 2 billion years. And in fact, the diamond ages, we dated some of the diamonds from there. There are some diamond ages that give ages of around 3 billion years. They, those are model ages, but actually the most reliable ages are 2 billion years. Here's South Africa, where yes, there's 2.7 to 3 billion year old lithosphere, and there's old diamonds, but in Siberia, world-class diamond mine, 2 billion years is the lithosphere, and the diamond ages are also 2 billion years. So, the other interesting thing is these 2 billion year old lurzolitic diamonds here from Siberia, many of these are in very large diamonds. There's a colleague of mine, Larry Taylor, who went to the, there's a, there's a big diamond museum in the Kremlin that's full of the Russia's biggest diamonds. They have hundreds of very large diamonds. And he looked at the inclusions in the big diamonds, and lo and behold, a lot of the inclusions in the big Siberian diamonds are lurzolitic, they're not hard spaghetti. Here's the diagram that shows that. that these are lurzolite compositions in these big Siberian diamonds. Some of them are hard spaghetti, but many of them are lurzolite, which was a surprise. So we should be looking in areas, other areas other than 2.5 billion year old crust and mantle, and we should be looking at areas where you have lurzolitic diamonds as well, because some of these places with lurzolitic diamonds have very large, very valuable diamonds. Lastly, I'll mention I can't not talk in Brazil without talking about super deep diamonds, because in many ways Brazil is the home of super deep diamonds. And by what by that I mean so 200 kilometers is fairly shallow for, for, for those of us that work on diamonds at the moment because there are these populations of diamonds that come from the base of the Asinus there, the transition zone here, and into the lower mantle. I think the maximum, so far the record estimated depth for an inclusion pair is 820 kilometers. So these, these diamonds give you actually actual pieces, real pieces of the Earth's mantle coming from depths of 800 kilometers or more. And the importance is that if you look at, if you calculate the volume fraction, so if you take the volume of the whole mantle, and you say, okay, I'm gonna just focus on lithospheric diamonds. The diamond factory in the lithosphere is just 2.4% of all of the Earth's mantle. In the transition zone, that's 23%. The lower mantle is 50% of the Earth's mantle. So there's many, many more diamonds here and here than there ever are in the lithosphere, which is why it's worth trying to find deposits that are rich in super deep diamonds, because there are way more diamonds down here than there are up here. And as we'll see, some of those diamonds are some of the biggest, most valuable diamonds on the planet, appear to come from here and not from here. So here are this map again, which you will be familiar with now. These are the, 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 at the moment, the most famous super deep diamond locations, some in Australia, South Africa, Central Africa, Canada. But then the most famous one is in Juina here, in, in the Amazonas Craton. And five years ago or so, we published a paper where we found the first example of ringwoodite 
Ringwoodite is an olivine, but it's the high pressure form of olivine. So here's a, a phase diagram of the Earth's mantle for peridotite. Here's depth, here's the proportion of minerals. Here's normal olivine, and when you get into the transition zone here, at 400 kilometers and then six, 500 to 600 kilometers, here is ringwoodite. It's the high pressure cubic form of, of olivine. And here's how we found this. This was a little gray, uh, very difficult to identify mineral, which we identified with Raman spectroscopy. This is a synchrotron X-ray map, and it turns out that there is a calcium silicate phase here. This, as well as the that, sorry, as well as the ringwoodite, in contact with each other. And that calcium silicate phase, which is here, puts the depth of that diamond. You have calcium silicate and ringwoodite present. It constrains it very precisely to be here. So this is real ringwoodite. It's not, in some of these phases, they're retrogressed. The high pressure crystal structure has retrogressed to a low pressure crystal system. And this ringwoodite inclusion, it's still the high pressure ringwoodite crystal structure. It has not retrogressed. So that diamond must have come up very quickly containing calcium silicate perovskite and ringwoodite from about at least 520 kilometers of depth. Now it turns out that ringwoodite is armite? Yes, it's tra it was trapped in the diamond and so in, 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 yes. in the diamond. Yeah, it is impossible to bring it up without it being trapped in the diamond. Yeah. In fact, when we measured the pressure in the diamond right here, there's a 2 GPA external pressure at room temperature and pressure in that diamond because there's such huge stress because the ringwoodite was trying to burst out from the diamond. In fact, it did. When we tried to cut this diamond, it exploded, unfortunately. The other interesting thing about this ringwoodite is that as you go deeper in the Earth's mantle, these sorts of olivines, the wadsleyite and the ringwoodite, they like to take in, or they're able to take in more and more water. And so if you had to predict where all the water is in the Earth's mantle, it's going to be here. You can put up to 3% water in Wadsleyite and about 2% water, depending on the temperature, into Ringwoodite. And when we measured, when we measured our Ringwoodite, <coughs> we find that it is actually, it has about 1.5% water, consistent with a cool temperature in this transition zone here. So this area, we, the evidence was that this area is a big water sink in the Earth. But that diamond, if you look at this diamond, you are not going to give this diamond to your wife. I, not if you have any sex, no. But new inclusion studies made by the Gemological Institute of America have shown that these very large, very valuable pink and blue diamonds worth millions of dollars, these inclusions are super deep inclusions. They're not ringwoodite, but they are calcium silicate, ferropericlase, and in some cases, very high pressure garnet forms, a form of garnet called TAP. So this is the Karoe mine, which we've had a student working on. This mine produces the biggest diamonds in the world currently. So that is a 600 carat beautiful type two diamond from Karoe. That's a $70 million diamond. And that is a super deep diamond. It's formed in the transition zone or <coughs> deeper. It's not formed in the lithosphere. <coughs> These are other diamonds from the same mine. And you can see that in this, this was one month's production. There are no, very few other mines. There's probably one other mine in the world that you could go to and recover diamonds this big in one month. These are all super deep diamonds. They have inclusions in them that are more consistent from the transition zone or the lower mantle. You can see the sizes, 200 carats, 300 carats, five, nearly 500 carats. When we measure the garnets in some of these diamonds, you can also see, so as you squeeze garnet to high pressure, you put more silicon in there, and so the pressure in these inclusions gives you a depth equivalent to 420 kilometers in some of these diamonds. So, <coughs> Again, part of the exploration future is going to be predicting where to find kimberlites like that with super deep diamonds. Because this kimberlite, Karoe, was assessed by the Beers 10 years ago, and they decided it wasn't worth keeping because they didn't bulk sample enough of it to find a big diamond. So they sold that mine to, to Wukara Diamonds for $45 million. 
that's less than half the price of that diamond. <laughs> so you need to understand where to find super deep diamonds because then they'll give you diamonds like this. <laughs> the difficulty is, of course, that when you're looking at the lithosphere, we can, we can evaluate what's, be, what's in the lithosphere using seismology. So this map, the seismology, tells us what's directly beneath the crust. We know where the thick lithosphere is, that's fine. But if we want to look at processes down here and whether they've brought up kimberlites or diamonds at least, and maybe the kimberlites even also come from here into the lithosphere, those processes that are going on down there, this is a seism so that's a seismology map of 200 kilometers, that's a seismology map of slice at 670. This does not look like this, so it's very difficult to correlate the structure and processes of what's happening in the transition zone to what's happening here. So you still have to use thick lithosphere because that's where most of these, these diamondiferous kimberlites form, but, but I think we have to think a little bit more laterally if we want to find more places like Juina and Karoe, which is in here. So that's going to be the challenge doing exploration <coughs> in the next 10 years or so, because a lot of small companies in Canada now are looking for these type 2 super deep, low nitrogen super deep diamonds, because they want to find diamonds like that. Okay. Thank you. Uma pergunta, gente, professor Hyde. Most spaces have been synthesized by high pressure and high temperature experiments. And really found it was the lingotite. What's the idea to found? No. Okay. That's why I want to look at your green inclusion. Because okay. what was what, what? So. And the clay class you have found? Yeah. Yes. But so last year we published a paper where we found for the first time calcium silicate for Oscar. This, so, oops, excuse me. This is. In this, in this pair, this is CaSiO3, but yeah. the problem is it's extremely difficult to quench this phase at high pressure. So even in this diamond, yeah. this remained at high pressure, but this reverted to a lower pressure equivalent somewhere up here. But last year we found a diamond from the Cullinan mine which actually had an unretrogressed version of calcium silicate perovskite. Yeah. That's one reason I think that some kimberlites come from this depth, because it is very, very difficult to cut, to maintain actual calcium silicate perovskite at high pressure and get it to the surface without it reverting to a low pressure state. But yes, yeah, so we found this, this, uh, this, this, but in the low pressure form, but but in in contact with this. So we're pretty sure that it's that the depth of origin is from here. But I think the reason that Wadsleyite might have been missed is because it looks like a chrome diopside. No, so there could, be, there could be green inclusions in Juina diamonds that people have said, oh, that's a chrome diopside. It looks, it's exactly the same color. I so hope you will find it. <laughs> <laughs> what are the contents of the zinc? In um, trace element in the trace element composition uh, of kimberlite magma. Hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, uh, I don't know exactly. Um, so it would be interesting to look at. Yeah, I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. I would think yeah, zinc is an interesting element because it's relatively low in the perinatite, so it might reflect more the original source composition. Yes. Yeah. I will go and look. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so 
the question? Um, yeah, I'm sure Larry has tried that actually. And I think you can get recover the eruption age. So where they occur, that, that would be the most reliable way to do it, yes, because because that is the product of the reaction with the kimberlite, yeah, and so that must represent the kimberlite uh, eruption age. Yeah. But, but they're, they're relatively rare. I mean, that example I showed was a nice example for you. Yeah, you, you don't find many of them. In fact, it's extremely rare because the, the zircons that you do find, they're usually extracted with the diamonds. And they're actually of lower abundance than the diamonds. And the diamonds are parts per billion abundance, so the zircons are actually sub-PPM abundance. But that, that, that is a reliable criteria, I agree, to use when you find them. The problem is that you rarely find it because the zircons are individual, they've been separated out, and the, this physical process of getting the zircon to the surface abrades that reaction room away from the, the zircon. But actually, so, so now in the Saskatchewan Kimberlites, the eruption age we're pretty sure is between 90 and 100 million years old. We can find 250 million year old zircons there. Now, there are no crustal rocks of 250 million years old in, Sask in all of Saskatchewan, it's an Archean area. And these are big zircons. So these are older Kimberlite magnets that are crystallizing probably in the mantle and being resampled on the way to the surface. So. So it's not. To, I'm not saying that all the old zircon ages are wrong, but but, it, but where you have one zircon age on a pipe, I think is a good reason to go and get some more zircon ages or, or get some other ages. So the origin of the zircon there are from older kimberlites. From some well related to the kimberlite, I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Where can I find a microprobe for analyzing carbon and nitrogen isotopes? Well, at the University of Alberta. That's we 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 probably <laughs> we probably analyze we probably produce about ninety percent of the world's data on carbon isotopes and and not, and we produce a hundred percent of the reliable nitrogen isotope data and mm -hmm. analysis in diamonds. So I showed you that one with uh, plumbicide and. Uh, Hydromorphic diamonds. Yeah. Certainly, they will be different in the carbon and in the nitrogen. Yeah, well, yes. And I would like to analyze this without destroying it. Yeah. That's the point. Uh, you have to. <laughs> the problem with the I microprobe is that it's like the electron probe. You have to slice it and polish it. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. What, that's Unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> Unless we invent a new instrument. <laughs> okay. Uh, what do you know about the super deep diamond with newer size kimberlite? How is the calcium graph on that? Yeah, so Juina actually is probably an example. Yeah. Juina is a yeah. Um, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I, it depends. Yeah, you know better than I. The problem is that the like, uh, yeah. Problem. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I think those are. We don't know very much, but that's that's really one of my points, is that those are the areas we should now work, because everybody has focused on the interior of the great craton, and, and actually Karoe. Karoe is not on the craton, it's in this Magombi belt. I don't have a, a, ge a geological map of South Africa, but it's in the Peleoprotrozoic Magombi belt, it is not on the craton. And so is Arapa, actually. So, I see that the most diamond sample was Genesis it's coming from the big crack and the big diamond. Yeah. So yeah. And there, you never find big kimberlites, patch of kimberlites but out of the, the crack on there. Yeah, well that depends. So Arapa is very close by to Karoe, again, which is in the Magondi belt, and Arapa is one of the world's largest kimberlites. Yeah, it, it depends. I mean, I, I, I think we say that that is largely true because, yeah, most of the mines have been found on the crater. So it's a sampling problem, I think. We may find, so the Saskatchewan Kimberlites, they are also some of the world's biggest Kimberlites because they they come up and they have, they have a preserved huge tuffling, but they are very big Kimberlites. 
and they are forming in the paying approaches of the mantle and in paying approaches of trust. There's a little bit of our key interest way to the north of there, but, but my view is all of that is paying approaches over. They are very big capitalists. So yeah, I, I think it's an open game now, and it's just that it's the same with any. When people found the Argyle mine, that's another example, although there is, a, there is Archie in the mantle underneath Argyle in Australia. When De Beers were exploring for diamonds in Argyle, because it's in a lamproite and they weren't finding kimberlite minerals, even though they were finding more diamonds as they went towards Argyle, they turned around and went in a different direction because they had this model in mind that you yeah. had to find kimberlite minerals. And a small company found the diamonds in Argyle instead because they didn't have this mindset. The ball is part of Yeah. You have to think, the student, you should think laterally. You don't have all this baggage that we have of uh, models. So you, do, you don't have to believe what we told you. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for your talk. The kimberlite magma is very low in viscosity. Yes. Uh, what, uh, how is the eruption style and velocity uh, probably of a kimberlite pipe? Well, the estimates for there are various ways to estimate this, but one is if you look at the outgassing of argon in the plugger pipe that increased, you can see gradients of diffusion loss. And you can use those to estimate that in the the last 100 kilometers or so, the kimberlite was moving at 70 kilometers an hour. So very quickly. Faster than your traffic here. But that, that would be <laughs> <laughs> 70 kilometers an hour. Um, but the, beneath that, it's not really clear how fast the kimberlite is moving. That's more difficult to estimate. Yeah. If you believe that the preservation of this mineral Intact. Now, I think that evidence of actual calcium silicate phosphate, I, have a for this. I think that has to indicate that it's moving very quickly because it's very difficult to quench that in a high pressure experiment where you drop the pressure just like that and the temperature. So, so I, yeah, it's a feeling. I don't have data to constrain it, but I think even beneath 100 kilometers, they're moving at tens of kilometers an hour. By, by what mechanism? Yeah. I don't know. That's the volcanologist problem. In the eruption, you could explosive. Well, in the last parts of it, yes. Um, 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 and it depends who you talk to. So the, there are, I don't do volcanology on kimberlites because they can't agree with each other and they argue with each other too much. But the one group of people would say that this explosive phase of, of kimberlite activity is. Um, <clears throat> Is all due to water reaction, reaction of the kimberlite magma with water. But, but kimberlites have their own inherent water as well. So, but I think the really, the really explosive part of it, like like any igneous rock, if if, if the magma hits the water table, then then you will get if this thing starts, yeah, you will get that big interaction there. So so. so in, in South Africa, these are all Karoo sediments, which actually still had some degree of, they were not totally, um, uh, what's the word, diagenetically <coughs> mature sediments. And so these hit wet sediment. In, in Saskatchewan, they definitely hit wet sediment, and there's huge craters in the breath when that happens. Yeah. But there's certainly explosive activity coming through here because at this stage, the solubility of CO2 is very low, and so you have this high CO2, probably 20% CO2, which is soluble at 150 kilometers, and as the pressure decreases, that CO2 is like taking the top off the, the Coca-Cola bottle. That, that drives it too. Uh, are you uh, aware of any experiments on uh, the diffusion of light isotopes in diamonds? Because this could be a, a very nice speedometer. Mm. Yeah, um, most of the, so people have looked at possible diffusion of carbon isotopes and nitrogen in diamonds as much to check whether the carbon isotopes we measure are not 
been changed by diffusion. And all the evidence we have at the moment is that, that it, it, there's no diffusion. It just doesn't move. The only thing that might be mobile in a diamond is hydrogen. But even that doesn't look as though it is. But th th I mean, that, that would be a really cool speedometer if, if we could do that. Yeah. And to, to use that in super deep diamonds would be great. So we were, we have been looking at hydrogen in super deep diamonds. And they, we made one more analysis. <laughs> Okay. Oh. There is a theory right there that has a strong population of super deep diamonds. In fact, most of the blue diamonds from the transition zone come from Colombia. Um, yeah, that would be interesting to look at. It, it's hard to say for sure be, because there's this extra component of the water, and so the the size. It's very difficult to to define what what we mean by size because you'll get a very big crater. If you have more wet sediment up here, but, but I mean that, yeah, you might expect that, right? Because you need a lot of momentum to get from the transition zone and the lower mantle to the surface. Yeah. The problem with kimberlites is the sample is very biased because you're not looking at the same thing all the time. It depends on the erosion level and the age of the pipe. But that's a very interesting thing to look at. You mentioned uh, seven <coughs> miles uh, block of pipes. How much this means in potassium? Yeah. Uh, One percent, maybe. Right. And the magnesium, but particularly they are magnesium end member, magnesium rich, uh, quite end member because they have they have titanium as well, but. Um, but they are potassium rich, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yes. It's anywhere between two and five percent K2. Yeah. K2. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they, which is why they, uh, probably the higher potassium, the higher rubidium as well. The higher rubidium logarithms are much better for K2. So, mm -hmm. Maybe. <coughs> That leads to the question, okay, where does the potassium in the phlogophyte come from if the kimberlite is low in potassium? Which is a good question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I, I mean, I think, so my point about the low potassium in the kimberlites is that when you measure a kimberlite, so the, that's what the bulk kimberlite is. So, <clears throat> so if you go out and you measure a bulk composition on a rock, then the kimber, in the kimberlite, it's diluted by all that olivine you put in. So the parent magma could have considerably more potassium. Mm -hmm. yeah. One more question. <laughs> One more question. There are a few mentions of zinc bearing chromides yeah. in, uh, in diamonds. Mm. Um, zinc bearing chromides uh, are important stuff in Komati Islands. Mm. Um, <coughs> I always thought this, these cases <coughs> represent a uh, kind of shallow stage of diamond formation in uh, the Earth's mantle. Um, I, I think that there is it's a strong temperature dependence. I think to me it would more reflect the high temperature. So the the the, the spinel the chromites in the kimberlite <coughs> come from a peridotite that's very deeply derived. And so that means the temperature of that chromite is actually very high. So a high chromium chromite, you can stabilize way into the diamond stability. Yes. 60, 70 kilobars. Yes, uh, this is OK, yeah. but not zinc then. Yeah, it depends how rich in zinc you mean. Because the, the people. 4%, yeah, for OK. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's, that's an interesting hypothesis. How that water zone was measured? Was it, how was it measured? The water yeah. zone, how it was measured? Well, it's an estimate from 
So at, at the time we published that, there was one ringwoodite, okay, a natural ringwoodite, and we measured the water in it with an FDIR spectrometer. So the in infrared spectrometry, OH, has a big absorbance <coughs> at about 360, 3630 3, wave numbers. And so there's a, there was a very strong absorbance peak in the water there, which if you measure normal olivine, there's no peak there. Um, <coughs> the people that do very high pressure experiments, they, they made ringwoodite and wadsleyite where they have water present, and you can then calibrate the <coughs> water solubility as a function of temperature. And the, the amount of water we measure is in exact agreement with what the temperature is that you would estimate somewhere in that transition zone. Now, at that time, that was only one measurement of a natural sample. My colleague Fabrizio Nestola has since found three more ringwoodites, and they're all they all have water. So it, it looks as though whatever ringwoodite you find from that that zone, they, they are all water there. Is it mean they can know it or a molecule? It's it, it, it's FDIR spectroscopy, which measures the stretching vibration in the OH, OH molecule. Okay. Well, thank you. Sure.